We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, welcome. My name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host today for We Hold These Truths. Today is uh, February 2021, and we're very privilege and honor to have as our guest today, Walter Davis. Walter Davis was born about 75 years ago in Pee Wee County, Kentucky, not too far from Louisville. Hope I'm saying that right, Walter. Uh, spending... okay. he, Walter has worked for the last 60 years as a social justice organizer, starting to uh, when he helped desegregate the Democratic Party in Louisville. He's worked on civil rights, he uh, served in the Peace Corps in Colombia, South America. He's worked for the Encampment for Children. He went to Canada uh, to protest the war in Vietnam. He was indicted in 1970 for refusal to report uh, for uh, the draft. And was uh, that indictment was thrown out by the U.S. Attorney General about five years later. Bill has been married to his partner, Bill uh I mean, Walter has been married to his partner, Bill Fields, for the last six years. They've been together for over 45 years. He spent over 20 years training community organizers throughout the South. He spent five years as the director of the National Organizers Alliance, four and a half years as the director of the Tennessee Healthcare Coalition in Nashville, Tennessee. And he's currently an organizer and associate at the Appalachian Community Fund in Knoxville, Tennessee supporting, among other things, LBGTQ plus organizing in central Appalachian communities. So, Walter, welcome. I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit about how you got started and uh, who your mentors were early in your life. Mm, well, I was really fortunate because uh, I was exposed to uh, uh, Georgia Powers Davis, uh, and who was the first black and first woman elected to the Kentucky legislature. And uh, that was part of the fight to desegregate the Democratic Party in, in Louisville, Kentucky, which loved black votes, but did not like to have black candidates elected. So we, we worked really hard on that and, and, and scored some success, which is pretty hardy, heady when you're a, a teenager. And I was 15 when that right. happened and uh we'll start off with a victory on something where you actually saw some ch marketable change and by the way it's peewee valley not peewee valley. valley what did i say <laughs> Pee -wee sorry county <laughs> oh sorry peewee valley i hope you'll forgive I, me about that they were right <laughs> thank you i don't want to make that mistake again uh yeah, and can you tell me a little bit, you know, some of your early experience, I know in elementary school even and junior high school uh, uh, with the few black students that were there, how, how did that lead you to working for justice, uh, you know, as a white young person? What led you to be interested in that? Well, you know, I came from a, a 
primarily white rural background into the Louisville schools. And uh, Louisville, Kentucky was one of the first places desegregated in the South. And uh, it, it seemed to be peaceful, but that's because it was the desegregation really only uh, integrated a small number of students. And years later, you saw the real reaction, the white supremacists uh, who pushed back against uh, true desegregation of the schools. So I saw that as a, as a kid, these uh, young African-American students who came into a primarily white environment and had no preparation, no support. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, ironically, the first uh, biracial group I was ever in was Junior Achievement. And out of that came uh, a group that of uh, black and white students who organized to the also to uh, build a, a participation of uh, equal uh, numbers of black and white students. And uh, so out of the young capitalists came the, the people who were young people who were fighting to desegregate the Democratic Party and to open up to the, the people of the state. Well, where do you think uh, you did that? I'm sure not every white high school student uh, uh, had the uh, reaction you did to those black students uh, at that time. What, what do you think led you personally to react the way you did as opposed to the way, for instance, other white people did? Well, I think it, you know, we were a poor family and I, I, I drew some lessons as a poor white from our experience. And also, uh, you know, I experienced the liberation of seeing people standing up and fighting and, and gaining some, if not power, at least some voice in public uh, change. And uh, it was in, in very impressionable for the rest of my life that uh, people found their voices through organizing. Right. You mentioned uh, Georgia Powers Davis as a mentor when you were very young. Can you tell me a little bit more about her and what she did to influence you to become uh, an organizer for the past virtually 60 years now? Well, I think the biggest thing she taught me was that you, you have to have a strategy. You have to understand tactics. And she was very good in the legislative on the legislative front when she got there, of being able to work across uh, the the not only part race lines but party lines. When she first went to to uh, the Capitol to Frankfurt, she couldn't stay in a hotel because it was still a segregated system, uh, and uh, so she had to work on all levels. Ironically, uh, we have a mutual friend in Kentucky who still experiences some of those obstacles. Uh, Attica Scott, a dear friend, who is uh, in a similar place of isolation in the Kentucky legislature, but has stood up and given a lot of people a voice for the uh, who've been left and excluded. Yeah, hopefully we can get Attica Scott on this show. She's a young woman and now the only female black legislator in the Kentucky legislature. I know you were involved in the civil rights movement early on, even met Dr. Martin Luther King once. Can you tell us a little bit about what your involvement there was, Walter? I was mainly an activist. I, I wouldn't say that I was playing any leading role except uh, getting some people out from my small Baptist college to take part in, uh, in activities. But uh, I remember the first time uh, there was what was called open housing uh, in, in, in Louisville and seeing um, uh, white supremacists show up and actually stone Dr. King with police sitting and watching from a dis from a, uh, across the roads. So I, you know, the Louisville's got a long history of dealing with the police issues when it comes to race. And uh, so I learned from that. But I was not at that point uh, really an organizer. I was one of the people that, you know, you don't always hear about uh, who may have lived their whole lives being an activist, supporter, or community leader who don't get the cameras turned in their direction. So, Can you a little bit, say a little bit more about 
what you actually saw when you said Martin Luther King was stoned and uh, by white people throwing stones and rocks at him? Yep. He was, uh, a rock was thrown at his back as he was marching to go to the auditorium to give a speech. And uh, he was fortunately not severely hurt. But uh, that was pretty common, if you'll recall, uh, on civil rights protest. And, uh, it, it, you know, nonviolence was a pretty high marker for most people to, to follow through on. And all the uh, civil rights protests in, in Kentucky at that time were nonviolent, peaceful. And, uh, but it was the people who opposed you who were the violent. And it's interesting the parallels we see to today of uh, with Black Lives Matter, which the protests have been largely peaceful and overwhelmingly involving people who uh, did not come to create uh, violence. And yet the other side uh, carried off such capricious violence and, and hasn't been punished. So. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your years in at college in Kentucky. I, and then I know you went to Canada after that. But what was it like when you were a young man in college? Well, I was uh, at a small Baptist college. And I, I got my degree in two, two uh, years and eight months because I was in a hurry to get out <laughs> of school. Uh, and so I did. We had a trimester system, small progressive Baptist college at that time, and uh, which was Kentucky Southern College, which was strangled uh, by a growing conservatism in uh, the denomination. And uh, so I actually share with Mitch McConnell a degree from from the University of Louisville because they, they brought all of the former Kentucky Southern students under their umbrella. Um, and I so I was very much a political activist while I was student body leader at this small college and and uh, and also a volunteer in, in Appalachian communities uh, with the Appalachian Volunteers Program. Um, I don't know what's more. Uh, I was certainly not the... Uh, um, I wasn't the uh, representative of the majority of the students politically, but I was student body president. So the, most of them were Repub most of them were Republicans. Right, and I know uh, about that time you were certainly like many of us uh, protesting the war in Vietnam and uh, refused to uh, join uh, the U.S. Army as part of the draft at that time. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and your eventually being indicted and going to Canada? Uh, what was that like? Well, I went into two years in the Peace Corps in uh, Columbia uh, as a community uh, development volunteer in rural communities, uh, working with uh, uh, Indian communities and uh, Afro-Colombian communities. And uh, the, that, by the way, that was the first place I ever heard of uh, Saul Alinsky. I never had had any training in community organizing. It was a different Peace Corps in, in those early years of uh, training people in, in power and, and tactics and strategy. So that's where I got my Saul Alinsky part of the training. Uh, anyway, so I came out of the Peace Corps. I'm sorry that uh, Alexis trying to talk to me. Uh, I uh, came out of the Peace Corps, uh, worked uh, that summer for the encampment for citizenship, uh, which, uh, yeah, which, uh, which was, uh, I still have a relationship with today and supporting it, uh, which was wonderful high school kids. Uh, from all over the country, very diverse, probably the most diverse organization I'd ever met, and uh, uh, kids in their teens. And uh, I was leading the politics workshop while fighting the uh, uh, selective service. You got to remember, this was Muhammad Ali's Cassius Clay's draft board, and they'd already uh, taken their stand about religious uh, independence, religious freedom and uh, the right to refuse on that basis. And uh, so, uh, and, and one of the side stories on 
working for the encampment was that the kids found out I was facing this this uh, situation, and uh, the uh, they started debating what what I should do: go into organize inside the army, uh, go to Canada, uh, just not show up and go underground, and uh, so I, I let them have it have the discussion it was their right to talk about it too uh then i got a call uh the next morning that uh from fort knox from the mps at fort knox that these this group of young people had shown up and uh were leafleting soldiers talking to soldiers of fort knox against the war and fortunately they didn't arrest the kids and they were returned to louisville and and things were all right, but uh, a short time after that, I I moved I moved to Canada after uh, losing my last appeal on being a conscience objector. I spent and, twenty years. Yeah, and you spent twenty years. What was that like up in Canada? Well, it was where I am really sorry that there there is something uh, trying to interfere. Um, the uh, you know, I went like, you know, I don't know if you know, 75,000 at least went to Canada. Um, uh, and I found a, a, a place. I found a home and uh, was able to become very active politically as well. Even while I was working for the C Canadian government, I worked in immigration for the Canadian government while I was uh, organizing uh, uh, in, in uh, several, several areas, including uh, when the first Prime Minister Trudeau uh, declared martial law under the uh, War Measures Act. So after being there less than a year, I was out organizing, uh, talking to people about uh, uh, building a movement against uh, martial law. And uh, so those were, wow, you know, these were great times. I, uh, I was... Uh, I worked for every level of Canadian government, and I organized anti-war, some of the largest anti-war protests in Toronto, and uh, and also uh, did, did work on many other issues. Learned to have a great deal of respect for uh, what are called now First Nations peoples, the leadership of of Indians and in, uh, uh, Aboriginal peoples in Canada to this day. I, I have a special place for them and uh, in, in the, my consciousness. So. Right. so throughout those years, and I know back in 1975, you were able to come back to the United States. And I know you worked for decades organizing and training people throughout the so southern part of the United States. I wonder if you can tell us, I know it can't cover uh, more than 20, 30 years of work in a couple minutes in the short time we have. But you can tell us something about where you worked and who you met and what that was like working with the Southern Empowerment Project and the training and the organizers and the organizations that you worked for in those days. Well, it's every possible uh, kind of organization. I, we trained organizers from Louisiana to West Virginia and and uh, everywhere in the southeast and and worked with people in other regions who were doing uh, different issues that were similar. Uh, a lot of the groups that uh, are well known, Kentuckians sort of the Commonwealth, Save Our Cumberland Mountains, uh, uh, Jonah, which was, is, uh, was a primarily African-American organization in Western uh, Tennessee, uh, just all kinds of places where uh, people had not necessarily had an opportunity to work across racial lines before. And that was important for us that uh, it was, there were several things that when we started off, people weren't necessarily bought into fighting racism, uh, despite the fact you can't organize in the South without dealing with racism. And, uh, and later on other, uh, uh, other issues that uh, were used as wedges to divide people, um, gender equality um, uh, and discrimination based on uh, sexuality and sexual identity. Uh, they, uh, 
we I'm proud to say we helped introduce some of those discussions. We didn't always close them, but they continued in their own fashion all over the place. But I deeply admired local leaders and communities who were prepared to, to face the issues and talk about them and be honest, even if they had differences. And I think that's the, one of the critical things that's been missing for a number of years now is that we, we can't seem to talk to each other even when we have areas of agreement. We've let, we've let people uh, create, uh, build walls that uh, divide us when we have more in common than we have dif difference. I wonder if you could tell us something about some of the people you actually met, who they were, particularly the ones that impressed you for all those years working in the southern part of our country. Oh, I would uh, be, uh, I, I would be careful about that because people have deep memories in the South if you leave them off a list. Uh, but I, I, one of the most treasured relationship uh, was uh, with uh, a co-worker named Rosemary Derrick, uh, who was a, a long term, she was also very involved at one point in the National Organizers Alliance, but uh, she was a long term transplant survivor. Uh, African-American uh, from a rural African-American community. And she was one of the most uh, uh, natural uh, organizers, I always hesitant to use that term. She certainly was a natural leader. Mm -hmm. And she brought so many people along in understanding uh, the forces that were operating on them. And she, uh, she just was such an example, and unfortunately, uh, she she passed away. And, and uh, another was uh, Vicky Quatman, who told us who taught a lot of us how to do fundraising, and uh, that you couldn't do organizing if you're not willing to raise the money. Uh, that that's part of the work of of, uh, of social change. And uh, it, you can't necessarily wait for the foundations to pay for the revolution. <laughs> no, so, <that's> for sure. <laughs> and so Vicky really taught us a lot about how uh, the two things are related. And uh, she died uh, in the highlands of Bolivia, helping uh, women form sock making co-ops uh, for, for develop self-development. So everyone i uh, there's hundreds i could go through hundreds it's usually been colleagues and local grassroots community folks that i drew the greatest uh, in, uh strength from uh, and and like i said before they don't tend to be ones that are going to get their name in books right. um, that's, yeah. that's why it's important to remember those people and i wonder if you can look back uh over the all these years, it's been now over 60 years. What are some of the lessons you would draw for younger people who are interested in organizing for justice today in 2021 and into the future? What are some of the things you'd like them to, to know? Uh, well, some of it comes from my own experience of being, realizing this is a privilege uh, to do this kind of work, especially in my case for the whole life. Uh, you know, you're 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 privileged to meet these uh, folks who are in struggle, who's standing up and speaking for themselves and taking some control over events. Um, that's why it's important for not only the young to listen to the elderly uh, who've got uh, uh, our mentorship experiences to draw upon, but for us to pay it as older organizers to pay attention to what young people are saying. They've brought new methods. They've brought brought new energy, and uh, we we have to learn from one another because uh, that that's where we're going to go go forward. Um, I'd say celebrate. We are at a point where it's very hard to celebrate because you can't do it in a box. Uh, <laughs> you've got to actually be out uh, out in the world, and and so the pandemic's forced us to do things differently. But relationships and art and music and, and celebrating and creating beauty, uh, that's part of organizing, too. It is. It's not an extra. It's 
is yeah. essential. Is that's what that's I think what you're saying, right? Right. Yeah. And and I guess um, the lesson I have from the uh, many years of being aware of racism is that to be to be aware of your own privilege as a white person uh, that. Uh, you, you know, and as a, if you're male and if you're heterosexual, uh, that you enjoy privileges and which give you power over people who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to be an ally if you don't own where, where you are privileged. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say the other privilege I've enjoyed in my life is to do this, just to be able and to understand a little bit of why things happen in the world and to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, people ask, well, why would you choose to do that all? Well, I didn't make any money, but uh, I, I have had a hell of a ride. Right. <laughs> right. But you have a home and you have a, you have a husband now. And uh, what, what's that been like? Uh, a little bit. I know you've worked on LGBTQ plus issues throughout Appalachia. Uh, just in, we have just a couple minutes left, but I know you're now working for the Appalachian Community Fund. And I wonder, uh, what is it important, particularly for people outside Appalachia, like those of us in Massachusetts and the Northeast, to understand about Appalachia? Uh, don't believe the stereotypes. Uh, you know, uh, this region has been controlled by Boston and uh, New Haven and other places from people who had drained the wealth from the region. There's an incredible creativity and strength at the community level in, in Appalachia. And uh, we're going to be part of the solutions in this country. And uh, so don't read it. Don't believe every stereotypical novel that comes out or sounds are some New York Times article that uh, slams uh, the create the people who are trying to bring about change. Right, because you've actually been there. And do you have any uh, final words for other younger organizers, uh, whether they're they're in Appalachia or whether they're in South America or wherever they are? Do you have any final uh, words from all your sixty plus years of experience, Walter? Uh, well, I guess I draw on the LGBT movement and say. It gets better. Uh, there will be times when it doesn't seem like that's true, uh, and the you know despite the, the tragedy of the pandemic, people working together will make a better world. And you you are needed. Uh, my generation's pretty well done in terms of solutions. We're we're now supporters of young people who are leading the fight, and I mean young under fifty. <laughs> right, that's young now. Right. <laughs> but right. uh, and and God bless the Black Lives Matter. I think they they changed the the language and the uh, what's happening in America, and uh, we'll we'll need that inspiration for the future. Well, thanks a lot, Walter Davis, an organizer for over 60 years. My name, again, is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host at We Hold These Truths to Be Self-Evident. We hold these truths that all men are created equal, but it's taken people like Walter Davis to make those words in the Declaration of Independence come true, not only for people in Appalachia, but for people all over the country. So I want to thank you, Walter. We're really privileged to have you on We Hold These Truths today. And until next week and the week after, we hope to see you and we thank you for all you've done over so many decades. Thanks a lot. And now again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown. This is We Hold These Truths and I'm signing off. Thank you very much, Walter. Hope to see Bye. you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.